Lab number three deals with building the AM radio portion of our AM FM radio. Well, what is AM? Well, amplitude modulation can be represented by equation number one, where V sub C is called the carrier amplitude. A is the modulation index, although sometimes you'll find this in percent. We'll have to convert it to non-percent units, or straight unit. F of M is called a modulating frequency, and F of C is called a carrier frequency. In our radio, the modulating frequency is the audio signal, and F of C is the transmitting and receiving signal. So in our case, the modulating frequency is much, much less than the transmitted frequency. If you multiply this out, you get a product of two cosine functions. You also get a, a term over here with V sub C and the cosine of 2 pi F sub C of T. You may recall from trig that if you take the cosine of A times the cosine of B, you get one half the cosine of the difference of A and B plus one half the cosine of the sum in A and B. In this case, it would be our frequencies. So multiplying this out, we would have V sub C times the cosine of 2 pi F sub C T. And then we would have V sub C times A and then times the product of the two cosine functions. And that's going to give us a one half with the difference of the frequencies, and then a one-half with the sum of the frequencies. Now in Labrick, we're doing some of our testing with the Agilent 33250A, and it uses a slightly different definition for amplitude modulation given here, but you'll see in the experimental procedure that we'll take a look at handling that in terms of our calculations. Let's do plot equation one. It's the following shape, again, assuming that F sub C is much, much greater than F sub M. What you can see here is that there is an envelope on the top and on the bottom of F of C that represents the lower frequency modulating signal. And this is really coming from equation, go back to page one, really representing this term right here as the cosine is going from plus one to minus one. So we'd have a plus A and a minus A. That really represents the maximum and the minimum at the top and then the negative of that at the bottom. What we're going to do is we're going to chop off part of this with peak detector. The basic structure of the AM radio is what's called a superheterodyne receiver. I'm going to see kind of why this was done in just a few more pages, but our last experiment we built the audio amplifier. We're going to take a look at building over the next two weeks is the AM portion of the radio, and it consists of an AM oscillator. It's called a mixer, a first IF amplifier and a second IF amplifier, and then an AM detector and an automatic gain control circuit. Uh, the AM oscillator provides a signal that's going to multiply the incoming received signal in the AM mixer. What will be coming out of here then is a wave that has a frequency that's summed and a frequency that's differenced. It's then connected to a bandpass filter, which is called an intermediate amplifier, really intermediate bandpass filter, and it's actually set to a single frequency of 455 kilohertz, and we'll see why in just a minute or so. So if that signal is at that frequency, it'll pass to the second IF bandpass amplifier, and again get filtered out any extraneous signals that maybe got through this first filtering. So you got a lot of real sharp filtering from these two sections, and then whatever makes it out here to the AM detector will be able to strip off the audio signal and send it to the amplifier. Now one of the problems with the, with the radio, if, you, if you're moving around or driving in a car, is that the signal is changing in strength, and so you would get a varying sound in the speaker. So what we're going to do is feed back a signal to vary the gain of the first amplifier to decrease it if we get a large, louder or a stronger received signal through an automatic gain control circuit. Well, this is actually written out on page three. But let, me, let me give an example here as to how the AM process works. Suppose we receive the radio station AM 1240. Now that actually means 1,240 kilohertz or 1.24 megahertz. The oscillator is going to be set up so that when you're tuning the radio it creates a frequency based upon where the dial is. This is that AM 1240 and then adding 455 kilohertz to it to produce a composite waveform of 1,695 kilohertz. So now the mixer is going to create a sum and a difference with that frequency with the received signal at AM 1240. When you add 1240 to 1695, you get 
2.935 megahertz, and they're going to be outside of our IF bandpass amplifiers, and we have a center frequency of 455 kilohertz. But the differencing of 1695 with the received signal at AM1240 is 455 kilohertz, and this will pass through both amplifiers and give us a pretty solid filtering of the signal that's been received. What would happen if, if you actually received or maybe got pretty close to the radio frequency AM1390? Well, the oscillator is creating this 1695 kilohertz signal. We're going to create the sum and the difference with the maybe not intended received signal. And that's going to create a frequency of 3085 kilohertz and 305 kilohertz. Both of these are outside the passband of our IF amplifiers and thereby wouldn't be passed through the detector. Not a problem with with AM in that you can create what's called an image frequency. Let me explain what this means. Suppose that there was an extraneous signal that was transmitted at the receive, the station we were tuning our radio to, in this case AM1240. That frequency of this extraneous signal was that frequency plus twice the center frequencies of the bandpass filters. Okay. Well, if you take 1240 plus 910K, you get 2150. And so if that's mixed with the 1695 kilohertz signal, it will produce, in the differencing terms, 455 kilohertz. And this would then get passed through the detector. So you'd pick up some strange sound in the speaker when you encountered a frequency of uh, 2150 kilohertz. You could fix this up by putting a low-pass filter into the system to essentially not allow this to get to the mixer. Lastly, this automatic gain control block, what it's going to do is create a DC level that's going to go back and change the biasing of the IF amplifier in the first uh, try to maintain a constant signal strength at the speaker. The question now is, well, why, why are we doing this? Let's go back to looking at our definition of Q0 back on pages 47 to 49 of chapter 1. We showed that the value of Q0 could be calculated by taking the center frequency of a bandpass filter and dividing by the difference of its 3 dB frequencies. Now, what I want to do is show there's another theorem we could derive, and we'll do that at the bottom of this page, where if you knew not the 3 dB bandwidth, but some other value, in other words, maybe the four, minus 40 dB bandwidth or the minus 80 dB bandwidth, that you could actually predict the value of Q. So what I want to show is that if you have some dB attenuation, this would be a negative number for x, if you take that number divided by 20 and raise it as the power of 10, basically taking the dB units off, and that multiplies the center frequency over the difference of whatever x was. Let me give an example. Suppose that I knew the minus 40 dB bandwidth was 400 kilohertz and the center frequency was 800 kilohertz. Then applying this formula, we would have a minus a minus here, so we'd have 10 to the 2, which is 100, times F0, but now divided by the minus 40 dB bandwidth. You wind up getting a Q0 of 200. The reason I want to do this is that this is sort of how the IF amplifiers are set up so that we would reject the nearest radio station to the one we're receiving by at least 40 dB. So we can show this is pretty much the same way we did in uh, Chapter 1 on page 48. If we take the magnitude of the bandpass filter, and set it equal to the amount that we're going to drop by. In other words, if we're going to drop by 40 dB, this is going to be 10 to the 2. If you square both, well, first of all, H0 drops out. We square both sides of the equation, then we're going to get this term squared, which is here, and then we're also going to get this multiplied over here and squared. So we'll get a 2 in the numerator, besides the x over 20. And then this term under the radical would appear over here. Group all the terms together as we did before. We can take this and get omega naught to the fourth, twice the inner product, and then a minus omega to the fourth. And then we've got this term here and the same term. We bring this on the other side of the equation. We're just going to subtract off that term. Now, what we're assuming here actually is that this number here, without the two, is going to be much, much greater than one. So we could throw this term away. If we leave the term here, we can actually derive a formula for the 3dB case. But we're shooting for something much higher in the attenuation. Let me throw that one away. We're just left with this expression. Again, it would be an approximation, assuming that the term right here is much, much greater than 1. Now we can kind of group terms together here. We've got an omega to the fourth. We've got an omega naught to the fourth that goes there. And then we've got 
this term here, we've got this term here. Now we've got some of the same things here. We've got an omega naught squared and omega squared. Pull that out here. And I've got a 2. I'll put the minus sign here. I've got another minus sign. What I'm left with is 10 to the minus 2x over 20. And then I also have a q naught squared left over. You could further write this as the reciprocal of this term right here squared, pulling out that 2 again. But this now looks exactly like the equation we had on page 48 of chapter 1, but the term q naught is replaced by q naught divided by 10 to the minus x over 20. And so we'll have exactly the same roots as before, but just replace q by this new expression. So this would be our value for the two roots, which would be the difference of our um, x db case. If we take the difference of these two, this term drops out. We've got omega naught, and then this term twice, so the two disappears. Bring this up into the numerator, and now we've got the difference of the x db frequencies is 10 to the minus x over 20 times omega naught over q naught. Okay, and lastly, we can kind of cross multiply. So q naught then would be equal to this term, and then dividing by this term with omega naught. If you divide by 2 pi, we get the formula that we were looking at on the previous page. Okay, let's calculate the value of q naught, assuming that our center frequency is 1240, and that our 40 dB bandwidth is twice the difference between our receive station and the nearest radio station. The FCC assigns stations for AM radio in a certain locale, so it's trying to put them with a certain spacing in an area where you'd be receiving those. They're setting it up so that we basically won't be able to hear uh, nearby radio stations, but there could be a radio station closer than this, but physically in maybe another state or so, so there wouldn't be any chance of receiving that one. So if I take double that difference, that would be my bandwidth. So in this case, it'd be like 300 kilohertz total, but the difference in these two is 150 kilohertz. That would give me a Q of 413. In other words, if we take F naught and divide it by the 40 dB bandwidth, which would be adding 150K to this and subtracting 150K from it, you get the same value of 413. Now, if you mix it down to 455 kilohertz, and still, again, the nearest station that got mixed down in our case, it was 305 kilohertz. That's how the AM 1390 did in the previous page. And again, if we take twice that difference, that would be our bandwidth of our filter, say, divided into the center frequency. It would give us a Q of 152. In other words, if you take 150 kilohertz and add and subtract it to, from 455, you get the differencing of the 40 dB frequencies. You still have a difference of 150K in both cases between the original radio stations and the mixed down ones, but your center frequency has, has dropped down. So this is going to let you have a much lower value of Q. It turns out to make a Q this high is extremely difficult with physical inductors, but bringing that down by almost a factor of three or so uh, will let us build these circuits with pretty sharp filtering. So that's why they mix it down, is to be able to, to use lower Q filters.